Hey there again, everybody. I am doing a video today about movies. Again, another video about movies. I see. I even, I even like set up my movies, but well, I didn't set them up. These are my shelves. Maybe I should start this over. <laughs> no time. Moving on. Now I had a pretty good response a little while back to one of my videos, which uh, was just a fun little one I did about a bunch of older movies like pre-1980s, what I tend to consider a classic. Everybody has their own definition of classics, right? But I wanted to do some classics that I recommend, and I was trying to keep it uh, more more on the side of obscure, like not the most popular classics, because everybody recommends those. You know what? That was so much fun, I decided to do it again. So here we are, all of us. Today, I have 15 more classics that I recommend, some more obscure than others. So I'm going to start right away with a 1941 classic starring Barbara Stanwyck and Gary Cooper. The movie in question is Ball of Fire, directed by Howard Hawks. In Ball of Fire, Barbara Stanwyck is a nightclub performer who has a shady boyfriend. Gary Cooper is a mild-mannered professor who lives in a large house with a large group of likewise professors, mild-mannered, uh, who have made it their mission to put together an encyclopedia containing all human knowledge. His department is modern slang, a subject on which he knows nothing, so he ventures out into the real world and encounters Stanwyck. The police come after her boyfriend, who instructs her to find some place to hide out so she cannot be questioned. A temporary solution falls into her lap when Cooper invites her home with him so she can teach him and the other professors about the modern world. So, of course, she takes them up on it. As a group, she and the professors bond while she teaches them popular slang and dance and etc. It provides many sweetly comedic moments. And needless to say, her relationship with Cooper also grows romantically, and after the requisite series of misadventures, they couple up at the end. This is that screwball comedy you have been missing in your life. Also, this was remade in 1948 as A Song is Born with Danny Kaye and Virginia Mayo. Not as good as the original, so often the case. Next up, we have Love Crazy, also 1941. What a year for movies! This stars William Powell and Myrna Loy and it was directed by Jack Conway. Speaking of screwball comedies, this one seems to be the Powell and Loy outing that gets forgotten, and it doesn't deserve to be. This follows a very much in love couple who are happily celebrating their wedding anniversary. When, through a misunderstanding, and where would these comedies be without one, she believes he has been unfaithful and promptly files for divorce proceedings. Not wanting to lose his wife, he decides to pretend he is insane in order to keep the divorce from going through. There are some very interesting laws in their state, apparently. This one has many laugh-out-loud moments, and I heartily recommend it. Next up, Willful Peggy. A, a quick note, a lot of these are comedies. I, I just, I like the comedies. This one is all the way back from 1910 and is the oldest entry on this list. Of course, it is a silent movie starring Mary Pickford and directed by D.W. Griffith. I happened to catch this one at a local film festival and it stuck with me. It is a treat of a little movie. She is a peasant girl who catches the eye of a lord. She wants none of him, but her upwardly mobile mother arranges the marriage anyway. Things are very awkward for her as she moves into the man's house and proves she does not fit in with his fancy friends. The lord's nephew convinces her to run away with him, but it quickly becomes evident that his intentions are less than honorable. The lord comes to rescue her, and she is happy to go with him. All this seems very basic, but the movie is howlingly funny, and is quite ahead of its time in showing a more modern heroine with her own ideas about how her own life should work out. College. Speaking of silent movies, this is the other silent one on our list. It's quite a bit uh, newer than that one. From 1927, starring Buster Keaton, directed by James W. Horn and Buster Keaton. This one is my favorite Buster Keaton movie next to, of course, The General. In this film, Keaton is a shy student who excels at academics, graduating top of his class, but unable to earn the respect of the jocks or the girl he pines for, who has eyes only for said jocks. He follows her to the College of the Title and attempts to earn her respect and love by going out for myriad college sports and failing miserably at each one. 
Eventually, the girl's boyfriend imprisons her in her room with less than savory intent, and Keaton comes to her rescue. In the process, he inadvertently accomplishes all the physical challenges at which he earlier failed. This movie is a fantastic showcase of Keaton's physical prowess. Caution, though. <laughs> like many older movies, there is a caution. This movie has a blackface scene, and it's a doozy. So like many students, Keaton is looking for a job. There is a restaurant in town that advertises him, quote, unquote, colored waiters only. Ugh. So he promptly makes up with boot black, does a stereotypical shuffle, and wins the job. Somehow he fools everyone except the jock and the girl who come to the restaurant on a date. And at that, they only recognize him after a while. It was a common trope at the time to have a white person pretend to be a black person and all their fellow white people do not recognize them because apparently white people are idiots. Next up, venturing out of the silent realm. This is Murder My Sweet, aka Farewell My Lovely, also from 1941. What is going on here? This one stars Dick Powell and was directed by Edward Dimitrik. I never did know how to pronounce his name. The plot of this is convoluted as so many film noirs are. This one is hailed as one of those that began the genre. But Dick Powell stars as Philip Marlowe, and this is really all you need to know. Dick Powell was, of course, a big singing star in the early mid-30s, but that star had begun to fade. In this film, he reinvents himself, and boy, howdy, does it work. He nails the tough detective of the 40s bit and makes this one a re-watcher. Uh, this one also led to his stint on radio in a similar role, the detective Richard Diamond. Next up, I'm going to skip over to 1952 for an old favorite of mine, Pat and Mike, starring Hepburn and Tracy. This one was directed by George Cukor or Cukor. Again, I have only ever read these. I haven't ever heard them out loud. Hepburn is a gifted athlete who excels at pretty much any women's sport of the day. But she loses her confidence whenever her fiancé is around. He, of course, wants her to give up her career. Tracy is a sports promoter who she gets to help her in her quest to overcome her jitters and achieve the golf and tennis championships for which she longs. This one is a less known Tracy and Hepburn, but it's still a very enjoyable movie and notable for a couple of things. It is a 1950s movie which encourages a woman not to give up her career and, in fact, cheers her on. And... Hepburn was around 45, an excellent age, if I may say so, when this movie was made. Tracy, of course, was even older, but this is moviedom we're talking here, and 45 is past the age when female lead actresses are usually either put out to pasture or relegated to mother roles. Also, many popular female athletes of the day make cameos, including Babe Didrikson Zaharias, herself a great symbol of athleticism and rare sports role model for the women of the day. Next on the list, speaking of ones that ha, have parts that haven't aged well, Gunga Dean, 1939, with Victor McLaughlin, Cary Grant, and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. This was directed by George Stevens. Okay, so yes, let's let's just get out of the way the things that have not aged well. There is brown face in this movie. There's a lot of brown face in this movie. And uh, anyone with a brown face, whether a white person pretending to be or an actual brown person, they are shown to be subservient to the white folks. They are either uh, happily subservient or they are villains. This is based on a Kipling story, so yeah. Also, this may just be me, but it does kind of test your appetite for Cary Grant because he's so over the top for much of the movie, and it, it just wears on the patience, I find. However, on to what I can still recommend about this film. The performances are overall very good, and the camaraderie between the main fellows is undeniable. Eduardo Cianelli does, despite the brown face, give a stellar, memorable performance as the quote-unquote villain, and I put that in quotes because leading a murderous cult he may be, but then again, these random soldiers burst into his temple and tried to take gold which doesn't belong to them, so maybe he's a wee bit justified in trying to throw them to the snakes. Speaking of, there are many fantastic lines in this movie. I still quote, You displease me greatly and I ignore the both of you, to my older two kids who often bicker. And lastly, the cinematography shot largely out in the desert is just beautiful, and many of these shots hold up and could be done in movies today. 
Okay, skipping ahead, another Cary Grant, one in which she's not too over the top, I don't think. Operation Petticoat from 1959, directed by Blake Edwards. Some parts of this film are based on true events. It also has a lot of actors who went on to become TV stars, such as Dick Sargent. The story is told in flashback. Grant is a Navy rear admiral whose former submarine is destined for the scrapyard. He reminisces about his time aboard the boat during World War II. It was damaged by a Japanese air raid, and Grant and a skeleton crew managed to get it seaworthy and set off for Australia just before the Japanese took over the port. Along the way on their journey, they rescue a bevy of stranded female army nurses, set up an impromptu casino as a way to obtain money for much-needed supplies, and accidentally end up painting their submarine a bright and noticeable to the enemy pink. Since the sub is unrecognizable, the United States thinks it an enemy trick and fires on its own submarine, until the sailors hit upon the idea of ejecting the ladies' lingerie through the torpedo tube. As the Japanese at the time purportedly had no such thing, the crisis is averted and they are able to make it to Australia at last. Are there some dated parts in this film? Of course, it's a 1959 comedy based on sex and romance, but it is still fun enough to override that. Okay, next one. Let's hit it up for some drama. Stage Door, 1937, Catherine Hepburn and Ginger Rogers. Directed by Gregory LaCava. This one is pretty popular, and like I said, I'm trying to highlight lesser-known films, but I love this one so much I couldn't resist bringing it in. It follows a boarding house in the big city for struggling actresses. Hepburn is the moneyed young woman new to the house who doesn't fit in with the others. Rogers is the wisecracking, more world-wise one who suspects uh, Hepburn of getting her things through a sugar daddy, as some of the other women do. There's a large range of personalities represented, and quite a few soon-to-be more well-known actresses, such as Anne Miller, Eve Arden, and Lucille Ball. The bulk of the drama is carried by Andrea Leeds, who plays a luminous, shy girl, who hears of a play soon to be put on and who just knows the main role is perfect for her. However, when she goes to the producer's office, her appointment has not only been canceled, but she is so tired and hungry that she faints. Hepburn barges into the office and berates the producer for his callousness. Now, when her father gets wind of all this, he arranges to finance the play on the condition that she will get the main role. He is hoping she'll bomb and come back home. She is indeed spectacularly bad at the part, and it looks like things will play out as expected. However, on opening night, Leeds, overcome by hopelessness, commit suicide. The overwhelming grief provides the depth Hepburn's performance is lacking, and the play is a hit. This movie is itself based on a play, however, uh, it retains almost nothing of the original source material. Now, interestingly, the dialogue is based on the way the actresses talked on set to each other, and they were encouraged to ad lib. In fact, Hepburn's famous speech about the calla lilies is taken verbatim from an earlier movie of hers, which was widely panned by critics. 1939, another fairly popular one, The Women. The Women stars Norma Shearer, Joan Crawford, and was directed by George Cukor. I, I just love and rewatch this one every so often. It is also based on a stage play. And it's notable for, yes, having only women. Men do figure heavily into their world, but there is not a single man in this film. Shearer stars as a woman deeply in love with her husband, who is stolen away from her by Crawford. Wounded, she travels to Reno to initiate divorce proceedings, but changes her mind and decides to fight for her man. The film ends with their reconciliation. Again, many different personalities are on display, so it ends up being quite the gamut of performances, at least those sort allowed to women of the time. Some definite drama, but also good comedic moments, just like the last movie on this list. Next up, I'm going to bring it back to Cary Grant, but to tie it in with Ginger Rogers. Monkey Business from 1952, directed by Howard Hawks, and not to be confused with the 1930s Marx Brothers film, Monkey Business. This one is completely different. This is another screwball comedy, and it's one of Rogers' last films before she focused on TV and Broadway. 
In this film, Grant is a scientist trying to make a formula for youth. A sample of the formula gets knocked into a water cooler by one of his science monkeys, who doesn't have science monkeys. He ends up having some and starts acting like a 20-year-old. When Rogers visits the lab, she also has him by accident, if more than her husband, which makes her regress to being a mischievous schoolgirl. Now, of course, things snowball, including an event when all the stodgy scientists on the board drink the elixir, plus which encounters with Roger's old flame and Grant's boss's secretary, who is Marilyn Monroe, serves to stir up things even more. At the end, Grant has found success, and his and Roger's marriage is better than ever. Next one. The Producers, 1967, with Gene Wilder and Zero Mostel, directed by Mel Brooks. Yes, this is what the musical was based on. And I, I feel like it's kind of gotten lost uh, in the shuffle after that one was so popular. And it's a darn shame because this movie is so good on its own, even without musical numbers. A down-on-his-luck producer joins with an accountant to put on a show, purposely making it so bad that it will bomb on purpose and create a tax write-off, thereby reversing their financial situation. Of course, the show inexplicably is a big hit, which creates another problem. Their backers will be expecting a higher payout than the producers can give them. In the end, they do head to jail and continue producing shows with the prisoners, but also continuing to oversell shares to backers, having learned nothing. This movie is a lot of fun, and it's good to see where it all began. Next up, we're getting a little more recent with the classic movie Sleuth from 1972, starring Michael Caine and Laurence Olivier. This was directed by Joseph Mankiewicz, the last movie he would direct. I love a good mystery and a good twist, and this one keeps them coming. Based on a play, this follows Olivier, who uh, portrays a successful mystery author who lives in a grand country estate. He invites his wife's lover, Kane, to the otherwise deserted house one afternoon to give him a proposition, that Kane take his wife off his hands so he'll have more time for his own mistress. Kane objects that he doesn't have the money to do this, so Olivier directs him to take some valuables from the house. Olivier will then claim the house was burglarized and recoup the money through insurance. Kane agrees, but then Olivier pulls a gun and reveals it was all ruse to entrap Kane as a burglar and then kill him. This is just the beginning of a tangled game of cat and mouse, which, if at times a little obvious, is a masterclass of both plot writing and fine acting. Both actors got uh, Academy Award nominated for this one. I don't, I don't believe either of them won. I'll mention if they did. This was actually remade in 2007 with Kane in the Olivier role and Jude Law in the Kane role. I'm sure it was very good as well, but I had no idea this movie existed and I'm sure it was overlooked by many others as well. Okay, next one. And this is a segue <laughs> because the next one is Death Trap 1982 with Michael Caine and Christopher Reeve, directed by the estimable Sidney Lumet. It's based on a 1978 play by Ira Levin, but it's largely seen as the poor cousin to Sleuth. Caine is a famous playwright whose career is waning. Reeve is the gifted young writer who submits his own play for a critique. Kane realizes that if he can steal the play as his own, he will regain everything he has lost. This is another cat and mouse game, and really quite enjoyable. I deem it a worthy successor to Sleuth, and really it's quite ideal to watch these two back to back. Last up, we're going to come back around to Spencer Tracy with The Old Man and the Sea. This one was 1958, directed by John Sturgis, and yes, it is based on the Hemingway novel. This is a tour de force performance by Tracy, who really has to give one as he is nearly the entire focus of the film. A fisherman whose name is never given, Tracy has gone for 84 days without a catch. When out at sea for the 85th day... He manages to hook a marlin, but must then go through the intense battle of bringing it into shore. This is man versus nature at its finest, beautifully shot, and the script never lags. So that's it. That's what I got for this go around. Until next time, anyway. Uh, what have you got for me? I got many wonderful suggestions in the comments of the last one, and I'm I'm always anxious for new suggestions. I I haven't 
watched any of the last suggestions yet. I haven't gotten around to it, but uh, yes, I'm definitely compiling a list. So please, more suggestions to put on that list. Always appreciated. So until next week, watch more movies and read more books and uh, read the comments yourself and, you know, watch some of those movies and let me know how they are if I haven't gotten around to them myself. Also, take care of yourselves, drink water, relax, be one with the universe. And uh, at least until next week. And I will see you then. Bye.